Hello everybody, could people just confirm if we are live and you can see us and hear us on the chat please? I don't know. Um, Silence. <laughs> if somebody can hear us, just write in the chat saying, yeah, you're live. Oh, perfect. Thank you, Oliver and Theo. Um, well, welcome, everybody. Thank you for joining this panel titled Bioprospecting, Technologies and Ethics Through Western and Indigenous Perspectives. We will be starting just shortly. And I just wanted to say some introductory words. Um, this event is organized by the Indigenous Studies Discussion Group, a graduate student-led initiative at the University of Cambridge, which was started in 2019 with the objective to provide a platform for discussing issues affecting Indigenous peoples across disciplines, times and geographies. We are kindly supported and appreciated uh, the, the funding of the Cambridge Heritage Research Centre. This event will be live and uh, as soon as the live broadcast ends on this link. A recording of this event will also be available on YouTube, so you can follow us on our social media, ISDG. Um, we have uh, shared the hand media handles in the chat box in a few minutes. And um, you're welcome to write in with your feedback. Um, throughout the panel, uh, you're all welcome to post questions to the panelists in the Ask a Question box that, that you can see in the chat. Uh, and this will be taken up at the end of the panel. Without further ado, uh, I just wanted to introduce myself. My name is Emiliano Cabrera. I am a, a geography student at the University of Cambridge uh, doing a PhD. And I have the pleasure, uh, along with my colleagues at the ISDG, to welcome Abena Dov, Osio Asari, Daniel Robinson and Diego Soares for today's wonderful panel. Um, this, these scholars are joining us from very different geographies, from uh, the, the US, Australia and Brazil, uh, with research that links even more places, um, Pacific Islands, uh, West African countries and the Brazilian Amazon. Um, so we were, we're going to begin with the presentation of Professor Abena, and she's an associate professor in the Department of History at the University of Texas at Austin where she holds a courtesy appointment in the Department of Population, Health at Dell Medical School. She received her PhD in the History of Science from Harvard and is the author of Atomic Junction, Nuclear Power in Africa After Independence, published by Cambridge in 2019. She is also the author of Bitter Roots, The Search for Healing Plants in Africa, published uh, by Chicago in 2014. Her interests include how people create and share ideas over time and place, so without further ado, Abena, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Diana, for this opportunity to speak with all of you today. Uh, I just my Sorry, I lost you for a second. What was that? Oh, great. Okay. So I'm intrigued by this photo of the Earth oven in Papua New Guinea. And I'd love to, um, sorry, is there an echo for you guys? Uh, sorry for me, there is no echo, but uh, I would invite um, the other presenters. I think we're offline, but. Um... Okay, oh, I'll just continue. I was really intrigued by this photo of the earth oven in Papua New Guinea that you used to advertise the uh, seminar. I'd love to know more about this image and perhaps why you selected it. What's fascinating is the way in which the dried uh, mud gives a different cast to the, the skin color. It reminded me of a photo I took 
in Ghana and have used a lot to frame my own thinking on the relationship between indigenous and scientific knowledge. So here on the right, we can see bark that would be transformed into a medicinal bitters, um, an herbal detoxion being exchanged between someone in a white lab coat and someone without. I see this photo as a metaphor for the ongoing tensions and relationships between scientists and non-scientists in African settings. This moment of exchange happened at Alafia Bitters, a plant medicine business on the outskirts of the capital city of Ghana, Accra. Alafia means good health in Hausa, and this is a company run by the Atiako family. According to Jan Atiako, one of the co-owners, they use recipes um, that they've collected over the years from family members to make a variety of medicinal products. And these are sold in Ghana and overseas. By 1990, we have um, records from the ports that at least a thousand bottles of Alafia bitters went overseas. By 2000, reported exports for uh, Alafia and another popular brand, Asiyama bitters, had expanded to around 20,000 um, US dollars. And additional medicinal plant exports from Ghana by 2000 would have been around half a million dollars. And that's what's reported, of course. There would be um, others you know, that go below, below the, the radar. In my remarks today, I want to talk a little bit about how I got interested in studying the history of plant medicine, not only in Ghana, but also South Africa and Madagascar, and my ongoing interest in how scientists and non-scientists understand medicinal plant knowledge. So I could have called this talk Scientists and Healers in the Transformation of African Plant Medicine, or also perhaps Indigenous Scientists. In my book, Bitter Roots, I consider six different plants and their transformation into plant-based therapies. These are African stories of bioprospecting. And I really love the history of drug discovery from plants because it blurs the line between ways of knowing, what you might call science and traditional knowledge, and the people invested in different approaches. In my talk today, I want to discuss one of the plants that I treat in Bitter Roots and the specific case of what could be loosely called the Ghana quinine patent. Now, Cryptolepsis sanguinolenta is a plant widely distributed in uh, what, West what, Africa. I'm, I'm sorry for the uh, interruption, Abena. Would you mind uh, making the screen, uh, sharing the full screen so that we can see when you shift? Um... Uh, okay, so what is it? You're not seeing the full screen? Uh, no, uh, but below, next. Um, there's a sign in the shape of a, yeah, if you click that, we're going to see everything. Okay, is that better? I can see now. Um, okay. Uh, when, when you press share screen, make sure you press the button share entire screen. Sorry about that. It was, I just realized we weren't following the images. Okay, is this better? Wonderful, yes, we're set, okay. thank you. Thank you for letting me know, I appreciate that. It's like my students will let me go 10 minutes without telling me I'm on mute. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, right, I wanna talk about this plant, Cryptolepsis sanguinolenta. It's sometimes called fever vine and it grows throughout West Africa, not only in Ghana, of course. So this complicates questions of national um, control of, of genetic materials. A group of scientists in Ghana collaborated to transform this traditional uh, remedy for malaria into a patented pill made from its chemical derivative, cryptotachine. However, in the end, the patent expired due to failure to pay fees, and the Ghanaian scientists involved made products not unlike those that we saw at the Asiama and Alafia bitters complexes, um, such as tonics and teas. There are two main actors who have made a main name for themselves studying this fever vine. One is Oku Ampafo. Ampafo received a colonial scholarship to study medicine in Edinburgh, one of the first to have the opportunity. When he returned in the 1940s to what was then the Gold Coast colony under British control, he was not given a posting in the colonial medical service. So instead, he set up a clinic in the Aquapi Mountains near his hometown. He obtained some drugs from the capital city, Accra, 
Um, but he relied on plant remedies that he obtained from healers, local healers in his district. In a way, he became their apprentice, although he explained to me he, quote, had no time to dance and mostly concentrated on writing down their herbal recipes onto index cards. By independence in 1957, he joined what was called the alkaloid group. Alkaloids are those bitter um, compounds that can be found in medicinal plants that are often bioactive and, and form the basis for uh, pharmaceuticals. So a handful of pharmaceutical chemists, including Ghana's first pharmacy PhD, pictured here, uh, Albert Nitaki, they worked to isolate chemicals from medicinal plants. By 1973, Taki and Apofo joined forces to establish a Center for Scientific Research into Plant Medicine, which was backed by the national government. They had a clinic where a physician and also a traditional medical practitioner would see patients, and one of the plants they experimented on was fever vine. They ran a small trial to see if it could be used to stop falciparum malarial parasites, and this is a type of parasite that was increasingly drug resistant uh, by the 1980s. In the early 1990s, as Ivan Adai Mensa, a biochemist, explained here, um, hopes were really high that West African collaborators such as Albert Nitaki and Ampafo would be able to come up with a new treatment for malaria really based on African scientific endeavors and research. And in fact, Albert Nitaki even filed a patent, US patent 5362726, for a compound and method of treatment um, for falciparum malaria. And this was uh, filed jointly, Center for Scientific Research into Plant Medicine and Health Search in, uh, Incorporated, a US-based company. It detailed a method for deriving cryptotachyene, a new alkaloid which had been named in Tachy's honor. In the end, it turned out that harvesting roots of cryptolepsis to make the compound was not sustainable and quite expensive. And Tachy and Ampofo, as they aged, began to have a falling out. Um, Ampofo, really was collaborating more with American colleagues, and Taki opted to create a beverage from the plants, which he sold with his son, Reggie, to supplement his retirement. As Ampofo lay on his deathbed, he worked out an agreement with Phyto Riker Pharmaceuticals, a US-owned company started by his long-term friend and collaborator, Diane Wynn, who he had actually treated for breast cancer in the 1960s with herbal remedies. And so this had really created a, a good bond between the two of them. Wynn, had been one of the individuals behind Health Search International, which helped to do the patent for cryptotachyene. And uh, she was actually her third partner, her third husband was a patent lawyer. And they've worked out an agreement um, with Ampofo that they would have exclusive rights to the use of his name in marketing any products. Her company, Phyto Riker, created a tea to market in the West African subregion called Phytolaria. And this was designed to treat malaria. And you can see on the box, there's an explanation of Oku Ampofo, basically what I just told you about how he uh, had pioneered what we might call now bioprospecting research on medicinal plants in Africa. When thinking about tensions and conflicts between African actors, including African scientists, I find it useful to consider the question of class, those with tertiary training in science and those without, more than perhaps questions of indigeneity. And this is really in a West African context, especially where we didn't have settler colonialism um, and, and all of the actors in my story are you know, essentially indig indigenous. What exactly then is indigenous knowledge and is bioprospecting, a reimagining of biopiracy, the way to preserve it? At the end of the 20th century, there was a lot of discourse about saving indigenous communities. Art Davidson published this book in 1993, Endangered Peoples, which superimposed an image of a child from an indigenous community against uh, an image of the rainforest. Carl Beckwith and Angela Fisher in their book, African Ceremonies, pictured in the mi uh, middle, carefully photographed events seemingly untouched by modernity and time. And the medicine hunter, Chris Killham, and he, I've talked to people who received his uh, business card, it actually said medicine hunter on it, um, here looking for kava in the South Pacific in 1996, sought to get the lost cures of indigenous peoples. But what interests me here are the characters like the man on the far right, sort of this intermediary. The scientists, like those pictured here, who all worked over the years to expand knowledge on medicinal plants in Ghana. So what's the place of the indigenous scientist? In 1992, 
in Rio de Janeiro, we saw this world historical moment, and this is really some of what got me thinking about these questions and the case studies I wanted to find in African settings. There were worries about emerging diseases like HIV AIDS or Ebola, and hopes that indigenous people were purportedly more knowledgeable about biodiversity and could help find new cures. The chemist Thomas Eisner credited himself with the invention of the term chemical prospecting around 1989, and this was reconceived by ecologists including Walter Reed and Daniel Jansen to include biodiversity prospecting, later shortened to bioprospecting. But essentially, this is chemical prospecting, looking for new chemicals from plants in, uh, in the wild. At Rio in 1992, the Convention on Biological Diversity was established, and the language of the CB, uh, CBD was really effusive and problematic in parks. It talked about indigenous and local communities embodying traditional lifestyles, and these are the places where we would be uh, looking for help to bring out primordial knowledge. And I really grappled with this question of what does it mean to embody a, a traditional lifestyle? Um, you know, my father is from Ghana. He's from the Guan community, which is nominally a, an indigenous uh, first peoples group in Ghana. And yet when I hung out with my cousins in, in their towns and villages, really people were looking for, you know, ways to get to the U.S., uh, places to buy inexpensive blue jeans. They weren't really focusing on embodying traditional lifestyles. And yet these were some of the places where I did talk to individuals knowledgeable about plants. As Akhil Gupta has noted, at the very moment when the basis of their livelihood was being undermined and their way of life destroyed, indigenous people were being celebrated for their knowledge of the forest, their concern for the environment, and their philosophy of life. So in my own research, I was less interested perhaps in the types of benefit sharing agreements and more curious if these so-called indigenous existed in African countries and if they were a major factor in bioprospecting. This is a moment when actually there's a proliferation of, of urban areas in African countries. Many people, young people especially, are moving to cities. They're not trying to stay in, in rural environments. And are we telling them to be custodians of, of the rainforest and stay in rural areas? I'm not sure, just for the hopes of perhaps finding the chemicals. I also wanted to know what kinds of benefits African actors actually set up for themselves irrespective of international protocols. In fact, much of what was going on at companies like Alafia or the Center for Scientific Research into Plant Medicine fell within the types of benefits later outlined in the 2010 uh, Nagoya Protocol, but they were not tied to ethnic lines. It was not a question of specific indigenous groups owning knowledge per se, but more opportunities for providing profit for companies such as Alafia Bitters um, or the Center for Scientific Research into Plant Medicine. I'll go into my conclusions, but I just wanted to show you this one slide of the Center for Plant Medicine. Um, this is the, the company that was set up by Oku Ampafo and Albert Nitaki. And if you look at their product categories, you can see that much of what they, um, they sell are de decoctions, um, bitters, kind of a traditional sort of medicinal made with alcohol to bring out um, the, the, the chemicals and, and plant extracts. And this is very much in keeping with the ways that other um, um, medicinal plant manufacturers are marketing their products. So we aren't seeing as much a question of, of patented pills um, being the driver for this company as had initially been uh, and, uh, envisioned. So in conclusion, in the larger version of this talk, and I'm happy to talk about it, um, the history of drug, drug discovery from plants in African settings dates really to the dawn of pharmaceutical chemistry in the 1880s. Colonial databases provide access to information on healing plants from African countries. And African scientists, very much like sort of the colonial scientists we might associate with biopiracy, have sought process patents to secure rights to plant-based pharmaceuticals. They've also tapped these colonial databases for information on plants. Those invested in African plant medicine in Ghana, for example, have marketed herbal products as a primary avenue for deriving cash from plant knowledge. And tensions have arisen between those with college level training and those without. One university even set up a bachelor's in herbalism major to try and bridge these approaches, but often the healers without college are more knowledgeable on actual plant uses. So I'll end there and I look forward to our discussions. I'll stop sharing, I guess. Thank you so much, Avina. This was a wonderful presentation and I'm sure the audience is also 
receiving all these ideas and uh, engaging with them. So uh, after thanking you once again, I want to invite, remind all the audience that you can share your questions in the ask a question box. I see some comment right now. Um, so um, we're gonna start now uh, with Daniel Robinson, whom I will invite shortly. Thank you, Abena. Okay. Great. <laughs> we can uh, see you, we can hear you. I just wanted to introduce you very briefly, Daniel. Uh, okay. Daniel Robinson here with us. He's a professor of environment and society in the arts faculty at the University of New South Wales in Sydney. He has worked on issues relating to bioprospecting and biopiracy for more than 15 years in the Pacific region, Asia and Africa, and has three books and two edited volumes on these and related topics. He is also the Pacific Regional Coordinator of the EU and GIZ-funded uh, ABS Capacity Development Initiative. Uh, without further ado, Daniel Robinson, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and thanks so much for having me here today to, to speak to all of you. I really appreciate the opportunity. I'm just getting the screen to share, hopefully. Uh, okay, share. And Perfect. okay. Yes, you can see that. Good. Okay. Um, so I've I've kept this really broad in the way I framed this. I've called it bioprospecting, access and benefit sharing, and patent landscapes, just to talk a bit about the broad range of work that I've been doing over the last um, ten to fifteen years, actually. Um, so first of all, I just want to acknowledge that I'm on Darawal country in Australia, and that sovereignty was never ceded by. Um, the Darawal people in Australia, and I want to pay respects to elders past and present and emerging. Um, this is a, a custom in Australia that we do this um, to acknowledge the, the traditional owners of the lands that we're speaking from. Um, so yes, as as uh, um, as has been explained, um, I've been working on um, these issues for about 15 years. And um, I wanted to sort of go through, I guess, a bunch of case studies um, really briefly. Like I, I won't have time to go through them in great detail. But um, thankfully, Abena has um, given a bit of an introduction to uh, the Convention on Biodiversity and Nagoya Protocol. So I can probably skip through that pretty quickly and get into some of the more problematic examples. So things like biopiracy type cases or things that look like misappropriations, um, and then maybe some more positive examples. Um, and I, I'm sort of putting these out there as provocations as much as anything to, to get everyone in the audience to think about um, what happens in these transactions when there's um, biodiscovery or bioprospecting type research um, on biological resources, plants, traditional medicines, animals, um, and what impacts they might have on the, the, the holders of that knowledge, the, the owners of that knowledge, um, and what happens in the future. Um, and, and I've also, I, I don't, I've, when I first wrote my um, book, Confronting Biopiracy, one of the reviewers said, um, this is a great book. It really draws all these issues out relating to biopiracy and the misappropriation of indigenous knowledge. But we need some hope. We need some good case studies. We need some positives so that we can know that researchers um, can have the potential to do the right thing. We need examples. And so I did a second book that was kind of the opposite. It was like a sequel to the other one to kind of talk about more positive access and benefit sharing examples. So I'll talk about some of those as well. Um, so I think I can gloss over this pretty quickly, but obviously there were some changes in the 1990s in terms of the international legal regimes. And uh, Ben has already mentioned the Convention on Biodiversity, which you could kind of describe as a grand bargain text in terms of international law, um, because it, it certainly had those elements relating to traditional knowledge, but it also talked about sovereign rights over biological resources too. Um, and, and it included text on intellectual property rights. So there was this acceptance that research was going on, countries had sovereign rights, but also indigenous people had a role. So it was a real mixture 
um, that ended up in that final text. It was obviously influenced by the negotiations towards the TRIPS agreement in the WTO as well. And there was this discourse, and Bennett um, touched on this, that um, access and benefit sharing through bioprospecting could be this win-win for science, conservation and communities. But then every, you know, there were a lot of people in the years after this that were very skeptical of that. And a lot of NGOs um, started this discourse of biopiracy. And, and of course, the um, uh, Pat Mooney and um, Vandana Shiva are very famous for those discourses. And um, they're still with us to, until today, really, although they're probably not used as much since the Nagoya Protocol was completed. Um, so the Nagoya Protocol came into place in 2010 and in force in 2014. And many of you would have heard about this, I guess. And the focus really is on bioprospecting and biodiscovery and ensuring there's fair and equitable benefits arising from the utilisation of genetic resources and associated traditional knowledge. Um, and so it has detailed prior informed consent um, and permit requirements and benefit sharing requirements through mutually agreed terms. And now there's 130 countries that have ratified this, so it's, it's getting uptake around the world. But it's certainly not a perfect convention, a uh, perfect protocol. And, and the, as I said, the convention was sort of a real uh, compromise. It was like a real a bar, a grand bargain it's been referred to because there were all these different competing elements that went into the text. And I think the Nagoya Pro Protocol has gone a bit further than that. Um, and some of the things that it's done is that it clarifies um, and includes biochemical derivatives. So I know a lot of Latin American countries were pushing for the inclusion of um, biochemical derivatives. So it's not just the genes that we're searching for as researchers um, where we need to share benefits. But if you're using um, biochemical extracts from those plants or animals, you also should share benefits. Um, the scope clearly covers traditional knowledge. Um, so there should be fair and equitable benefit sharing relating to that too. Um, and it also encourages recognition of customary laws and community protocols. Now, there are some, um, there is quite ambigu ambiguous language in, in the text, and um, that's certainly something we can talk about. Um, so I've got a number of examples here, um, and we do pattern landscaping. Um, so to identify biopiracy or misappropriations, or even just sort of uses of indigenous knowledge in, in research and development, we, we trawl pattern databases. And this, so this is from Patent Lens, um, or just the lens. And um, we can identify the use of, of um, species through using keywords, basically. We use the, the species name as a keyword. In this particular case, we looked up the term emu oil and we found many different um, patterns. You can see by year, um, the chart is growing strongly in that case. So the emu um, is a really interesting Australian bird um, and it's an endemic species. And so when we're doing a lot of this patent, patent landscaping, um, we often focus in on endemic or near endemic species because you know where which country they're coming from. And then if you're thinking from that Convention on Biodiversity perspective, um, countries are regulating biological resources at the national level. The CBD talks about sovereign rights. Um, looking at endemic species makes some sense in that regard. So just to give this example, this is on emu oil. Um, we identified 46 patents um, from 19 patent families. Um, and a lot of them were filed in the United States. And so what's interesting about this is that um, in the 1980s and 90s, um, American farmers started farming emus. It was probably a really bad idea because the meat tastes terrible. I've tried it myself. Um, it, was, it was one of these fad um, attempts to farm uh, at different species. And um, so the, 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 a lot of the farms went bust. Um, the remaining farmers tried to find something new to do. And so they looked, I'm pretty sure they looked at indigenous um, knowledge from ethnobotanical texts, um, which describe the uses, traditional uses of um, emu uh, for skin care and as a liniment, a, a liniment for, the skin, uh, for the skin and um, for arthritis. So you can rub it in, into the skin um, and into joints, and then it reduces the effects of arthritis or it reduces skin uh, ailments. And that's been known for hundreds, if not thousands of years by Indigenous Australians. And the patents that we identified and patent applications, many of them are directly based on the Indigenous knowledge. And so that's extremely problematic. Um, the other thing I wanted to mention is that the emu is considered a totemic species to Indigenous Australians. So when we think about customary law, um, 
Indigenous Australians had um, cultural and spiritual connections with this uh, this particular species. They have ongoing cultural and spiritual connections with this species. Um, so it's highly significant to many Aboriginal peoples. Um, they have a kind of like a kinship relationship um, based on um, long-held beliefs with the emu. So you can imagine it's quite problematic if, if someone's claiming uh, exclusive monopoly rights relating to um, the use of oils from your knowledge, but also relating to a totemic species. Um, so this is just one example from one of the old texts um, that's, that cites a, a text from 1899 that um, Aboriginal people used um, uh, the animal fat liniments for rheumatism and muscul musculoskeletal pain. So this is, this is really, um, we've written a paper about this recently, and, and we argue that this is really Indigenous innovation. Um, the, the, these traditional users were actually um, probably experimenting on on the different parts of the the um, emu, and um, you could consider it an innovation. And then modern innovators and scientists have then sought to free ride on that, basically on that existing innovation. And so there is this clash of ideology between what is a traditional knowledge and what is a scientific knowledge, and what is true innovation going on in this process. Um, and I think that um, aligns quite well with what Abena was saying as well. There's another one relating to kakadu plum, which is um, endemic species and many um, endemic in Australia and many um, companies are also filing patents on this. Most of them Mary Kay company for skincare creams. Um, and this is problematic again for indigenous people in Australia. It's the world's highest source of vitamin C. And um, there's been a number of patent filings. We were able to challenge this in Australia and defeat the patent in Australia. Um, but in the United States, they've continued to pursue patents and, and in other countries too, um, particularly um, for skincare by Mary Kay Company. Um, so it, a lot of indigenous enterprises in Australia, so um, Aboriginal run companies that are producing um, Kakadu Plum are quite concerned about these filings of patents in other places. Um, and again, it's it's it seems to be somewhat based on the, the indigenous uses and, and knowledge of, of the kakadu plum, which was used as a high energy food. And, and we've since learned that it's the world's highest source of vitamin C. Um, and that's obviously going to be good as an antioxidant for skin care. Um, so there's a growing market for this. And obviously we've been talking about all sorts of different ways. How can we promote this? And, and certainly better labeling and fair trade and maybe other forms of intellectual property could help these in the, this sort of situation. Um, there's another one, Gumby Gumby, and this is another totemic species. So there's a patent filed on Gumby Gumby, and this has been problematic as well. Um, and this, this, you know, this is one of the dreaming stories here. Um, so for the Yurundali people, um, the Gumby Gumby bush spirit, a woman who lived alone by the waterhole, and one day while out gathering food, she came across the male bush spirit. They courted and fell in love, and when the Gumby Gumby spirit lady fell pregnant, she gave birth and the baby came out of the seed pod. And this was the birth of the Mungabara people, of the Yurundali people. So this is a, a story about the, the, the creation of, of, a, of a, a people um, in the, the First Nations uh, Aboriginal people in Australia. And so a lot of these species um, have this, to they, people have this totemic relationship with these plant species or animal species. Um, so again, this is another one where it's really problematic that people are filing patents based on traditional knowledge but also in relation to a totemic species. Now, there are some cases that we've seen that look somewhat like access and benefit sharing successes. So we don't want to be all completely negative, perhaps. Um, let's have some hope about the Nagoya Protocol and the Convention on Biodiversity. Um, the, there are, there's, this is one example from the International Cooperative Biodiversity Groups in Madagascar, um, where there was a lot of benefit sharing in terms of the construction of schools on the bottom left corner there. Um, in the top right, this is in central Madagascar. Um, there was, this is a conservation area which was funded by um, the Bioprospecting Ventures. Um, some of the activities and the campsite were funded by that. Um, fishing boats were funded in another community where they did bioprospecting for marine microbes. Um, and a lot of these benefits were shared up front and the project actually never discovered any new molecular entities for, for a new drug. Um, but I think some of the research is still going on um, back in the labs in the United States. 
these are some of the other benefits. Um, so schools and wells and um, and markets, as well as technological equipment for testing for diseases like malaria on the bottom left. In Papua New Guinea, there's another example where um, one of the ICBG groups uh, did research and they shared a lot of upfront benefits with communities where they entered those communities. They also built a herpetarium, which is on the left here, um, which is for treating snake bites. Um, there's a lot of venomous snakes in Australia and Papua New Guinea. And so um, it was really important actually for local communities that um, they were able to milk the venom of the dangerous snakes. Um, so that was part of the ICBG project and one of the, the benefits shared. There was also um, validation testing of traditional medicines and that's on the right hand side there. It was a traditional medicine that this woman was producing and um, they improved the efficacy and safety of that formulation um, in conjunction with that lady or by working with that lady. Um, this is a really interesting one and this is an Indigenous scientist. So this is um, Dr. Graham Matheson who now lives in Sydney and he, um, but he was born in the Cook Islands. He's a Cook Islands Maori man and he developed a, a, a um, cosmetic cream but also a bone healing drug um, and wound healing, cartilage healing. Um, he's an orthopaedic surgeon. Um, and he developed this based on a traditional medicine that he saw used to, to treat um, people um, when they'd broken their arm playing rugby, you know, when he was growing up in the Cook Islands. And so he's now, um, he's set up a lab in, in the Cook Islands where he produces the oil that you can see in the bottom photo here. Um, and he's, share, he's actually made the Kotanui, which is a, an Indigenous representative group um, recognised by the Constitution in the Cook Islands. Um, he's made them a shareholder in, in, in the company he set up called Simtech. He's also made them joint um, patent holders with the patents. So they stand to get dividend benefits from the, um, the drug when it gets the, on the market and it's still being developed to, to get on the market, whereas the cosmetic cream is currently on the market today. On the right hand side, I've got the Rauhi Marine Protected Area there, and um, I know I'm running out of time. Um, one of the roles of the Kotanui is to protect the marine areas, and that's part of their customary law um, relating to biodiversity. And um, so that that's, um, seems to be a, a sort of like one of the win-win sort of situations that we hoped would come out of the Convention on Biodiversity, for example. And then last, I think, there's the Moroccan Argan case, which I can talk to ad nauseum. So I'll probably just skip over this one. But um, th this is another interesting example where some big companies like L'Oreal, Cognos, and BASF um, have, have shared benefits through women's cooperatives for the production of um, unique high-end products relating to Argan, not necessarily the, the shampoos and face creams that you buy quite cheap at a supermarket, but um, some of the high-end creams, um, there's been quite a bit of benefits back to those um, co women's cooperatives. Um, but I think, you know, I, I should wrap it up um, and, and allow time for questions and discussion. Um, so I just wanted to leave people with a few questions here. And there's certainly um, a lot to still um, ask for and hope for from the Nagoya Protocol, whether it will really work. And also about things like patent reform, like a disclosure of origin requirement. Will that really help? Um, there's certainly questions we can ask about the dematerialization of plants and animals through the omics fields, like genomics, um, and whether that will circumvent um, some of the regulations that have been put in place to try and prevent biopiracy. Um, and then also questions about how we can better respect Indigenous people's knowledge and innovations, and also their customary law. And I'll leave it there, thanks everyone. Um, I certainly, I've got a lot of references, I'll just skip through all that. Wonderful, Daniel. Thank you so much. And I do look forward to, to the moment in, in Q&As when uh, we can all discuss more, more in depth all the ideas you've presented. I will now uh, invite uh, Diego Suarez um, to the screen. Thank you, Daniel. Thank you. Hi, Diego. We can see you. Can we hear you? Yes. Uh, good morning. Good afternoon and good night. Good night. That we have a good time. Oh, perfect. Yeah, I, I was just uh, with a bit of delay, but I can hear you now. I, I'd like to briefly introduce you. 
Um, Diego Soares da Silveira is a professor of anthropology at the Institute of Social Science of the Federal University of Uberlândia in Minas Gerais, Brazil. His research interests include ethnography, study of traditional environment knowledge, um, symmetrical anthropology, actor network theory, biopolitics, and governmentality. He researches principally in the Brazilian Amazon and Cerrado regions, and also has also worked in the Genetic Heritage Management Council of the Federal Brazilian Government, following the political and ethical controversy surrounding the institution of a federal biodiversity law. Looking forward to your presentation, Diego. The floor is yours. Thank you, Emiliano. I'm going to try to share my slides here. Let's see if it works. Okay. Open here. I don't know if you can see the slides right now. Yes, we can see it in full screen. Thank you. Okay. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here on this panel I, and to share this moment with my colleagues, Bena and Daniel Robson. I hope the discussion that we have today can give new perspective about this important uh, issue of your perspective through Western indigenous perspectives. My idea today is to come back to my PhD thesis at the anthropology department of the University of Brasilia that came out from research done from 2007 to 2011. And that was published in a book called Sociotechnical Networks in the Amazon. Translation of Knowledge in the Field of Biodiversity, that was published in 2012. That came from a multi-sided and multi-actor ethnography of the process of legal government regulation of access to genetic heritage and associated traditional knowledge in Brazil. My main goal then was to understand how this process affected the knowledge relations between researchers and indigenous and riverside communities in the Brazilian Amazon. My theoretical approach came from the symmetrical anthropology, actor network theory, science and technology studies, Amerindian ethnology, and Foucault's concept of biopolitics. My starting point was an ethnography of legal, legal government practice at the Genetic Heritage Management Council. That's a federal institution that was created in 2001 with the aim of conceiving a new regime of access to biodiversity and associated traditional knowledge. That has to do put into practice some principles of the Convention of Biological Diversity that was signed by Brazil in 1992. Uh, we had an introduction about the historical context from the talks of Daniel and Abena. I'm not going to repeat myself here. Uh, I did a survey, initial survey on institutional archives from where I selected two research networks to follow in the field. Both researchers were authorized by the Brazilian government and has an objective to, to establish a dialogue between science and traditional knowledge and practice. I wanted to see how that worked in practice. So I did an ethnography of knowledge and translation practice involving researchers and communities and how these practices were affected by, new, by this new regulatory regime. My idea today is to do a critical rereading and an ethnographic update of my study from new research line that established in Federal University of Uberlandia from 2012 until now. Uh, that was an ethnography of Pito Cerrado network that was established in 2006 and then involved, involved knowledge relations between scientists, rural, rural communities, indigenous people and folk wood healers in the Cerrado Triago Mineiro. I, I would also like to have in consideration all the government political changes that have occurred in Brazil since 2016 and to try to establish a dialogue with the most recent studies by authors such as Ingold, Strathairn, Harway, Latour, and Moore, on notions such as Anthropocene, Capitocene, Citocene, Necrocene, and Meshwork theory. Uh, those notions, those, those concepts were not around when I did my, my, my research, my PhD research. Uh, it's really important, uh, the ideas that we mobilized 
think other people's ideas, the world that we world, the world that we used to work other worlds, as uh, Harry uh, says from the reading of Stratern works. So I like to, to be inspired by two ideas. First, the meshwork theory, uh, the idea that world of life are made of things and people that are continually coming into being through process of growth and movement, a world made of fluxes and flows, meshwork made of lines of movement and growth. Life is lived along lines of cool movement where plants, animals, and people are associated in the common project of living and dying. Another idea is come from, from the reading of the book of uh, Donna Haraway, Staying with the Trouble. And the task is to become capable of responsibility with each other. Our task is to make trouble, to stir up potent response to devastating events, as well as well to settle troubled waters and rebuild quiet places. We have to be able to tell multi-species stories and practice of becoming with precarious times. And that also has to do with her concept of citocene. The unfinished citocene must collect up the trash of the Anthropocene, the exterminators of the Capitocene, and shipping and layering like a mad gardener make much water composed piles for still possible past, presence, and futures. So I'm going to be inspired by these ideas to tell a few stories about bioperspective and uh, biodiversity access, also access to traditional knowledge from these researchers that all of them were authorized by the Brazilian government and that have to do with putting uh, uh, practice uh, all the principles that were enunciated in the, in the Convention of Biodiversity. Uh, of biodiversity. Uh, I'm sorry, Convention of Biological Diversity. Benefit sharing, prior consent, informed consent, and also recognition of, of national concerns about these questions. The first case uh, is a uh, rubber community, rubber taper community that was established in the lake of Purupuru that's in, located in the Amazon. You can see here the Manaus, that's the capital of the Amazonas, that's Brazilian states. And here is the location of this community that was nearby the town. And uh, this, research, this research involved a, a network of labor, uh, pharmacological laboratories and researchers that collected plants and knowledge on this, uh, on this Riverside community. Uh, this Riverside community was established uh, by Northwest immigrants that came attracted by the Amazon river bloom. They established themselves in that region uh, in the 19th century, uh, where the, the, the community is located today was a old rubber site and uh, they uh, had different kind of relation with local indigenous group that involved war, forced integration and also mixigenation. They lived in uh, by fishing, agriculture, hunting, gathering activities that respond to a specific ecological cycle that has to do with the, the, the rain in the region, the rain seasons, and dry seasons in the region of, of Amazon. So I looked up and I went to the community, the Versailles community, and looked how women uh, live together with medicine plants side by side, side and how they, they, they manage the plants on their, in their backyards, how they use this plant to, to make uh, traditional remedies, and uh, how does the stories about uh, sharing the world with plants and people also had to do with the taking care of family health, and with the local value of beautiful gardens of medicinal plant as uh, a way of empowerment of women in the community and how they, they manage these traditional remedies to cure their parents and their, and, and 
people that live with them. Women and medicinal plants live side by side, get sick, heal and die, composing and making with stories of synthetic love and care. That's a daily relation with plants that they have, where stories about plants uh, take us to stories about the relation, uh, the kinship relation and, and community relations. Medicinal plants is also a man's knowledge. And they find medicinal plants in the forest, on trails and gathering activities. And this uh, knowledge circulates uh, by st stories that are told bravery stories that are told uh, in the community and that um, give a local value of masculinity and knowledge exchange. Uh, we can see how in the community, the plants, uh, it's a mediation actor to, to, to gain the relations through and also uh, intergenerational relations. The circulation of knowledge through neighborhood and kinship relations. So, as you can see here, this community is located in a lake and have other communities around it. They are all integrated in a kinship by kinship relations, and the plants uh, circulate circulate on this on this on this uh, network of communities. So, the medicinal plants are used in the communities uh, have plants that came. Uh, that I also find in Africa that came with, uh, with, uh, with uh, the men and women that were slaves and came to Brazil to work on the, on the sugar factories of, of Northwest Brazil. And also some plants that come from, from European colonizers. And those plants get mixed with, with other Amazonian pl uh, plants that were uh, known by the relation with indigenous local people. So it's a very mixed, uh, mixed uh, knowledge of plants that come from different regions uh, that, that are also found in different regions of Brazil and other outside countries. Uh, I also studied the, the impact of traditional healers and roosters and how they dialogue and integrate outside intellectual resource into riverside knowledge. So we, we have to think about this Traditional knowledge is something dynamic and open to other influences, incorporating other uh, other knowledge, uh, and that that also has to do with uh, continual experimentation, innovation, and knowledge practice. That has also we can use the image of bricolers' work and how these different traditions get together and are mixed in an experimentation process. Um, in, in the beginning of the 21st century, uh, the Catholic pastoral work, now these are very Catholic communities, uh, tried to order the community local networks to produce medicinal plants for building a popular pharmacy integrated to the local health system. So that was a project that came from, from, from a congregation uh, of Virgin Mary, uh, that was established in the region, and they tried to incorporate this, this traditional knowledge and the medicinal plants in a regional political health project. So you had a lot of co political controversies around that project, um, questions about the therapeutic eff efficacy of these plants and their toxicology. So the, the people from, from this community went to the Federal University of Amazonas seeking scientific validation of the riverside knowledge associated with the production of traditional remedies from medicinal plants. And then we come to the pharmacological project, and we all know that the pharmacokinesia of medicinal plants has as a main, as a main object to go from plant to medicine. And that's a very complex process that involve interscientific relations between different disciplines, the, establish, the establishment of relationship with the pharmaceutical national industry, and also with the community. Uh, that project involved uh, plant and knowledge collection in the community, 
the establishment of a relationship with national pharmaceutical industry, and the process of transformation of medicinal plants into herbal medicine and other natural pro natural products, what we call bio bio, bio prospecting. Uh, I follow the knowledge practice in the laboratory and how the researchers uh, get to know the plants and, and, the, and the biological extracts that come from the plants using and, and dealing with also laboratory instruments uh, that uh, helps to translate uh, this knowledge practice into pharmacological knowledge. Uh, we also can see how uh, this project involves translations of interest and the attraction of political support and economical resources from the region and how the researchers uh, came from the region and they were inspired by uh, the idea of the invasion of, uh, of an Amazonian sites that also had to do with following, following Amazonian knowledge, what was called Amazonian law knowledge and medicinal plants. So we can see how the plants, when they get to the laboratory, they get transformed into biological extracts that after are multiplicated in different uh, extract conditions and put into tests in the laboratory to try to, to see their therapeutic efficacy. That also involved dealing with animals in the laboratory context and uh, trying to, to, to replicate uh, the health problems and to cure them, uh, having the, the, these animals as a metaphor of what would be the, the efficacy, the therapeutic efficacy of those, of those medicines in, in human people. Um, the other, the other case that I studied, the other research network that I follow, involved indigenous agrobiodiversity in northwestern Amazon. You can see here it's a region near Colombia. It's very far on the northwest of the Amazon. You have more than 19 different ethnic groups, indigenous ethnic groups in this region. I did my my field work in San Gabriel da Cachoeira. That's the last city before you get inside the, the indigenous territories. Uh, it's a city that has more than 95% of its population is indigenous. You have a lot of circulation from the communities to the city and from the cities to the communities. A lot of circulation of indigenous knowledge associated with agrobiodiversity. That network came from a social environmental NGO that was founded in 1994. It's called Instituto Socio Ambiental, and they established a historic partnership with Federation of Indigenous Organizations of the Upper Rio Negro, uh, helping them to establish their indigenous reserves, reserves and also uh, contributing in the elaboration of sustainable development, pro pro development projects. So this research had also as an objective the fortification of regional regimes of circulation of knowledge associated with agrobiodiversity management and involved the collaborative work that had also the participation of indigenous researchers that were integrated in the, with the, 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 the researchers from the NGO and worked together uh, collecting knowledge and plants uh, in the gardens and trying to, to see uh, how these people understand their relationship with their plants and how this knowledge circulated uh, on that region. Uh, you can see how you, when we are talking about maniac, that's a specific case, you have different uh, different kinds of maniac, and that's how agrobiodiversity is understand, understood. And uh, it's this rich knowledge about agrobiodiversity, different kinds of plants of the same species that is, is value as an important Amazonian patrimony, indigenous patrimony. You can see how this 
had to do with the translation of these networks of circulation of knowledge, agrobiodiversity, and traditional knowledge associated with the management of agrobiodiversity, you have the use of, uh, of softwares that translate this, these networks into graphics. And that's a very important translation because it has to do with uh, the project of patrimonializing this, this regime of circulation of knowledge in the region uh, and, and also contributing to reinforce this, to reinforce and to preserve this, this network of exchange of knowledge. But we had an expected uh, conquest, or, I mean, from the relation with the indigenous uh, agricultures, uh, the researchers and indigenous agricultures built an agriculture fair for the commercialization of indigenous farm products. And, and, this, uh, and this agriculture fair became a place where uh, indigenous that live in the city can exchange their knowledge, can eat their food, can dance their music, and can uh, and, and can uh, have a, a moment of, of exchange uh, on that urban context. Uh, so that was a uh, desperation uh, of, the, of the research that was not thought before as a benefit sharing, but it really helped the people to get their product uh, commercialized in the region and reinforce their, their agricultural practice. Last case that I wanted to bring is the Fito Cerrado ne Network. That's my last research. This uh, uh, network involving researchers and rural communities uh, from, that was established in 2006 and still exists. And, and that's in the Triangulo Mineiro uh, region, in Minas Gerais, here in red. Uh, and you have a regional system of production and circulation of medicinal plants and traditional knowledge on this region that started before the colonization process in the 19th century. This, uh, this regional system is uh, being, it's in risk because of the fast industrialization and urbanization of, 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 of the region. And how and that also has to do with what uh, we establish of agroindustry in this uh, on this region, uh, producing sugar cane and, and other products for export reasons. So here I also follow the practice in the laboratory and how this uh, traditional knowledge is translated uh, into pharmaceutical tests of therapeutic therapeutic e efficacy of these plants and how this knowledge circulates in fairs uh, by the router job of, of, of educating the, the medicine remedy, the, the medicine remedies, tr traditional remedies. Uh, and what we see, and that's the, my idea today, was to bring some positive cases, how from the trashes of Capitolocene and Anthropocene, uh, we find uh, projects that try to integrate scientific and traditional knowledge, respecting uh, benefit sharing and trying to put uh, in practice uh, intellectual rights uh, of indigenous people. Right? Um, and what I try to, 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 to disinvolve in my research, and, and I still have that on my mind today, that didn't change, is that we are not talking about the same object. The plant that is known in the community is not the same plant that researchers know in the laboratory. You have a, a process of translation, uh, digitalization of knowledge, Trans of material transformation of plants in biological extracts, and that has other objectives. So the, the object the, 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 that came from the knowledge practice in the laboratory is not the same plant that it's known in the community. Even in the community, 
the planes that are that are, are known by the women are not the same planes that are known by, by men, right? So we have we, we have an idea that that comes from Mo Anna Mary Mo and John Law. Uh, it's called ontologic politics. That when you have different knowledge practice, you have different objects. So we're not treating about the same objects because the knowledge practice of community the community law the community knowledge practice and the knowledge practice in the, lab the laboratory uh, came from different ontological perspectives. So what we he really have to think about is how this, uh, this, this relations affect the ontological perspective of each group. In these cases that I brought today, uh, we have a positive arrangement of perspectives where the practical results of the research don't affect the, the, the revival and the dynamic uh, of this uh, regime of circulation of knowledge associated with medicinal plants. Uh, so uh, you see here specific case, positive cases of integration of scientific and, and traditional knowledge. Uh, but we have to think that things have get worse and we still have the limitation. Uh, and one more time, finishing my presentation, I, went, I want to, to remark this, this idea. It's very important to, 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 to look forward for the ideas that we mobilize to think other people's ideas. And what we see in Brazil is that this, uh, this new law and this new regime of, uh, of access to traditional knowledge associated with biodiversity is very Eurocentric uh, and, and try to mobilize ideas that are very important, are very associated with the intellectual property rights history uh, in the occidental thought. And, and how, as we can see, benefit sharing uh, has, it's uh, directly associated with, with a contractual model. Uh, and that's very difficult to, to put in action in this different context where uh, indigenous and riverside communities had another way of thinking about this thing, uh, this problem. So we can see that the, the, the process of, uh, of thinking about the new um, legal uh, government regime uh, had also a pedagogical uh, objective of, of trying to teach uh, riverside communities, peasants and indigenous communities about this new language that came together with this, with this new principles that were put in practice. Well, but things can all, always get worse. And uh, we can see that today Brazil is going to a necrocene uh, where all this knowledge and all this biodiversity is being destroyed uh, by miners and diversity activities. And, and, and all these, these areas of biodiversity are getting destroyed, destroyed. And we have also a lot of old, um, old indigenous people that, that, uh, that died by COVID-19, uh, by the virus, because we don't have a government today. So we have a destruction in the Amazon, and by this destruction, uh, it's not a good situation for this project. Uh, I I'd like to end my presentation with this station of McBride. What I wish to propose is that we recognize the Nicocene, a new bat, as a fundamental bio, 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 biogeological moment of our era, the capitalism. The Nicocene reframes the history of cap capitalism expansion through the process of becoming extinction. The accumulation of capital is the accumulation of potential extinction, potential increasingly, increasingly activated in recent decades. This becoming extinction is not simply the biological process of species extinction. It is also distinguishing of cultures and language, 
either through force or assimilation. There's the extermination of people, either through labor or deliberate, deliberated murder. Okay. Wow, Diego, many thanks. This was a really insightful presentation. Can you, you can hear me? It's okay, let me just, okay. Perfect. Thank you once again, Diego. This was really wonderful. And let me now just invite the other panelists, Abuna and Daniel, on screen so we can start a more open conversation between all of us. Here we are, Daniel is just joining. Um, yes, so I want to reiterate now uh, that all of your presentations were, were really wonderful and they have taken us through different times, geographies, but all, and even when we, you were all presenting about bioprospecting, the different uh, theoretical and methodological approaches you have used really shine light on different aspects of, of, of these uh, practices and activities. This diversity of practices got, that go by the name of bioprospecting. I just wanted to open a few minutes right now um, between um, uh, all of you to maybe offer some thoughts on potential avenues of, of collaboration between your researches and your approaches, but also to flag some uh, potential fertile uh, points of tension um, that could arise from historical approaches, uh, um, actor network theory approaches, uh, but also from uh, legal geography. How can these different gazes collaborate? How can these different gazes shine light on different aspects of bioprospecting? And more broadly, uh, my invitation would follow something that ha has come through in all of your presentations, which is uh, meditation on what is the role of producing scholarship on bioprospecting. It, um, what are the possible agendas of this scholarship? Is it to produce hope, to uh, offer critiques, to change how we're doing things, or is it to shift uh, completely the languages through which we speak of, of these practices? So um, I know this is a really broad question, but I'm just really curious to, to know how you think about the collective but decentralized agenda that uh, scholars of bioprospecting do together, although each on their own lane. So w I think we can go in the same order that uh, we presented. So I'll invite Abena if you want to share some thoughts. Thank you. This has been a wonderful opportunity. As, as trying and challenging and tragic as this time of coronavirus has been, it does open up these opportunities to speak with people, you know, Brazil, UK, Australia, we might not have tried this um, two years ago. So I've, I've really enjoyed hearing from, from each of you. Uh, there were two things that struck out for me listening to your presentations. Um, and I must say, it's really an honor to be asked to participate with all of you much more expert on some of these issues. You asked what's the, the role of, of this kind of scholarship. Um, I'm trained as a historian primarily. So for me, I was curious to know kind of what is bioprospecting over the long durée? How far back could we start talking about chemical prospecting and kind of what are the antecedents to what we see today in our contemporary time? Um, perhaps especially looking at the roles of, of of scientists in, in African countries who were basically doing what we're trying to mediate now, but you know, half a century or, or more before. Um, so I would definitely say that I'm a, a, I'm not a policy person. I'm a, an academic. I'm somebody who opens up problems as opposed to solving problems. I fully acknowledge that. Um, so one thing that came out for me a lot listening to uh, the presentation by Daniel first, and I'll just make a quick comment about that, is something that I've been wondering is when we look at these global considerations around bioprospecting and think about different geographical experiences, to what extent does the um, 
does the location and the nature of the country at hand really play a role in the discussions? I was struck by the fact that with the cases from Australia, Papua New Guinea, you are really talking about um, uh, biological materials that are very much focused in that region. You know, you're not going to be getting emu oil from from Ethiopia or, or Kenya, uh, and in terms of the, the geographic boundaries, it is fairly constrained. So I was wondering, given your vast knowledge about all of these different cases, the extent to which some of what you've been able to do with in Australia or Papua New Guinea has been, um, it's been possible given the, the geographic constraints of, of the materials you're, you're looking at. Um, and then I also wanted to know just more about the Simtech lab and other kinds of as you said, an indigenous scientists who had been looking at ways to market their products and maybe form these, these benefit sharing agreements. Because I find that often the scientists I've looked at have been beholden to their communities and it's like understood that they'll set up a school or Okwampofo, for example, set up a hospital and a clinic and, and they're giving back to the community in some ways. All we're doing with the Nicolia um, approach is just like saying, we have to be more ethical about how we do this and you have to give back to communities in some way. You can't like take the stuff and run. So kind of thinking about how those obligations and, and ethnic communities are, are, are manifest. For Diego, um, of course, I was really interested to hear all of these different case studies from Brazil. Brazil is just a country that's so fascinating to me personally. Um, and someplace I hope when things are in better days, I'll have more chances to visit and, and learn um, from you and others. One thing that I was reminded in your presentation and something that I had failed to do in mine and, and perhaps Daniel as well is really looking at the gender gradient and thinking about who has access to knowledge and who's benefiting from the knowledge. Um, and perhaps you might speak a little bit more about what that means in a Brazilian context. I'm not as familiar with all the different intersections of, of, of race and class and gender and, and ethnicity and how that's all coming together in, in some of these um, kinds of agreements and, and conflicts that you might have been documenting. So I, I would love to know more about that. Um, I often see a patent as like a fancy male recipe, women, collect and share recipes and, and some of these process patents are kind of, you know, you could crudely call them male recipes, you know, they've they've captured up some data and made it harder for especially women to get access to or even to understand. So thinking about the ways in which science is often gendered more male and traditional knowledge is more female, how, how are these uh, manifest? So those are just two quick comments. I know you said three minutes. I'm sure we'll have so much more to say. Thank you, Abena. Um, I think the, the, those questions and comments really open up some discussion. So um, should we go with Daniel? Sure, thank you. Um, that was a really good question, Emiliano, about um, what, what, what is the role of scholarship on bioprospecting in this space and, and, and thinking about you know, bioprospecting policy and all these things. Um, I remember doing my PhD and it was on, it was with the Human Rights Commission of Thailand and it was on biopiracy in Thailand. And, and I remember thinking exactly that question. Um, and my examiners kind of sort of talked about it in their reports at the end. And, and it is odd, isn't it? Um, so the, the, I, I, I think, um, yes, I, I, I agree with your point about hope, perhaps, that, that um, or, or at least about learning about different geographies, different cultures, different ways of seeing, thinking, and knowing and doing. And I mean, I think I'm, I'm often, you know, I'm I'm not indigenous, and and so I'm often um, schooled um, by people in re remote communities in the Pacific and remote Australia about um, extreme. You know, Australia has extremely diverse cultures. There's there's hundreds of um, indigenous language groups and and um, First Nations peoples, and I think people a lot of people don't even realise that that the Aboriginal peoples are. Uh, are sort of one people, they're, they're, there's hundreds. Um, so I'm often schooled about um, the diversity um, of the cultures, but also of the traditional knowledge of the medicines, of the connection to country. Um, and it's all very connected and it's interconnected. Um, and I think that's really interesting and important. And, um, and I think that's certainly something that we can all learn from the, doing this sort of work. And it can inform the policy thinking about, you know, how we might stop 
uh, misappropriation, all that sort of thing. Um, with a Benner's um, talk, I, 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 I really like the historical approach and, and I, I think I often somewhat take a historical approach in my work too. Um, I, I, I think it's really important to look back to even as far as the colonial era, um, the spice trade. I often teach a class about bioprospects and I start with the spice trade and um, talk about um, the fact that the, 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 the big trading companies were actually kind of like bioprospecting companies, going out and finding orchids, finding pepper, finding um, cinnamon and all these sorts of things around the world and bringing them back and creating monopolies. And so it's very similar to what we're seeing today. It's just history repeating itself, but um, the, the policy frameworks we're seeing maybe a little bit more aware and enlightened. And I think that is the perhaps the role for scholarship um, to, to, to learn a bit more uh, about the diverse knowledge systems. Um, and Diego's, I really love Diego's talk and, and, and I know nothing about the Brazilian Amazon except for one case study about a habanero pepper, which was appropriated in the US. So I, I can share that later. Um, but yes, I, I, I thought that was really interesting. And I'm really, um, one thing that often gets me, and I think Abena mentioned it in previous conversations that we had about, um, about traditional knowledge and well, traditional knowledge about knowledges um, and how they're shared and how you know this idea of traditional is is kind of is a construct, but also this idea of modern and scientific is a construct, and it's all it's all very blurry actually. Um, the, there's the, there's no black and white traditional modern etc. Um, and um, the way we share the way knowledge is shared between say say healers in indigenous communities and 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 how that um gets gets um spread is 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 really interesting and important to these discussions because when you you go look at the policy debates in geneva in the world intellectual property organization for example um there's very fixed ideas about protecting this knowledge from this place you know and that's kind of what abena was getting to i think with that question about the geographical specificity um but often you know traditional knowledge is widely held and widely shared um sometimes it's it's held close by traditional healers and in some communities um so there is there is a lot to think about there in you know because because there are forums saying we need to create these global laws about protecting traditional knowledge but if but if we don't think about the way traditional knowledge is shared um and think about the the way we as humans have the way we create knowledge and and def and how that knowledge gets diffused it's 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 kind of pointless to try and create these laws you know um so i think um oh and the only other thing uh, Ben mentioned on gender um Yes, the Moroccan Argan case is a really interesting one to do with gender, actually, because it's there's a thousand years of um, knowledge relating to um, Argan oil, um, and it's women's business. It's been women's business, but I, you know, a lot of you probably have heard of Argan oil or seen shampoo in your supermarket, and um, it's it's become really big business, and so increasingly it's men that that run those cooperatives and businesses and sneak into the 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 trade, the Argan trade. Um, and so there is a there's a very interesting shift in the gender dynamic after a thousand years of, of, of women's business in, in Argan. Um, so there's definitely some really interesting um, dimensions to that as well. And and it it, it reinforce uh, this there's a strange sort of reinforcing of um, things going on as well because there's money coming into those cooperatives. And so the cooperatives either sometimes they they've got more money so they can send their daughters to high school, which is uh, sometimes unusual in parts of Morocco. Um, but in other cases, there's a perverse incentive that they get their daughters to work in the cooperatives to bring more money in. So then those daughters don't go to high school. So the, the re there's a kind of a cyclical issue going on there with the cooperatives and with benefit sharing and the money coming into to the Argan, uh, through the Argan trade. Um, so that's definitely, you know, there's, there's Positives, but there's also perverse incentives to 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 not go to school, for example, um, for young women. Um, anyway, there's lots more to think about. Um, I'll, I'll hand over to you, Diego. Thanks. Hello. Um, it was very interesting to hear 
my colleagues, uh, Daniel and Obena. I wish we passed, when we pass this, this, this COVID uh, period, we can get together in Brazil, why not? <laughs> or I can go to Australia, I can go also to meet you. Uh, um, I think that the historical perspective is very important. Uh, I didn't, uh, I have in my research, I have investigated in my book, I did this uh, historical perspective. I didn't have space to do this here. I wanted to, 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 to bring the diversity of cases and to give an uh, ethno ethnographic perspective of, of, this, of this issue. Uh, but I uh, realized, uh, I, I agree that historical perspective is very important because it's historic perspective that can uh, disconstruct this uh, very Eurocentric ways of thinking about other, about other ways of thinking, right? And how this is constricted in a narrow vision of intellectual property, property rights where you have to find and establish fixed frontiers of knowledge, where you have to find the owners of knowledge. So you have a lot of, 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 of ideas, the whole uh, cosmology, occidental cosmology, that is mobilized on this lawmaking process, right? And uh, one of these ideas is that uh, knowledge doesn't circulate. Right? Knowledge is fixed in a place and is reproduced in, in history as something that can be called property, right? And that people can, uh, and that, that people have rights on that property. So it's, that's a very occidental way of thinking about this problem. Right? Uh, what, when we have a historical perspective, uh, let's, let's have the example of one of the cases that I that I brought to our discussion, uh, the plants, the the medicinal plants that were cultivated on this riverside community, uh, also a branch plants that are uh, that came from Africa, plants that are used in Europe, right? And all this knowledge is also present in other riverside communities, not just in the Amazon, Brazilian Amazon, but also in the Northeast region, and also in the Cerrado, that's, that's what I found, that this knowledge circulates, that people circulates, that it's difficult to find and to establish fixed frontiers for the knowledge. But we also have to, 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 to be very critical about the generalization of this knowledge as popular knowledge, right? We have to think that this uh, circulation also involved translation practice. And when knowledge circulates, it also changes by new experimentation, by integration of different traditions, right? So we have an innovative process, right? So when, when knowledge circulates, it's not the same knowledge. Knowledge, when it circulates, it gets translated. And when it gets translated, it's also uh, it's also changed by people as they put that in in, in relation with other trans other tradition that they are uh, that they also mobilize. Right. So um, I think the historical perspective uh, is very important. I would like to to put a question from from hearing my colleagues talk today. I, I really was curious about knowing how was the process of making a biodiversity law on these countries, on this region, and how that uh, and how that process integrated or not integrated with local and regional regimes of circulation production production of uh, medicinal plants and and the knowledge that is associated with the management management of these plants. Uh, so because when Daniel says that we are talking about a global system, a global regime, right? And I think that was the main objective from the Convention on Biological Diversity. All these countries try to put these principles in practice by national laws. So I wanted to, to hear more about how this, this process of making a, a 
national law incorporates or dialogues with uh, this regional system of circulation of knowledge and how the, this, this different communities think about uh, the relation between property and, and knowledge. Right? So I, I was very interested on that, on that perspective. Um, so, um, I mean, it's, it's a great pleasure to be here and, and to hear, and I think we, from the discussion, we can forward uh, a lot on, the, on our, our research, and uh, I'm really looking forward to our discussion. Thank you, Diego. And I would just like to open very quickly if Abena and Daniel would like to get back to um, Diego on this idea of how law um, conceptualized biodiversity or how biodiversity laws emerged in, in the context you study. Um, yeah, sure. I'd be happy to answer that. Uh, yeah, I think it's better if everyone else is muted. Thinking about biodiversity is interesting. My colleague at University of Texas, Austin, Megan Raby, actually works on the history of the concept of biodiversity and kind of from a biological history perspective, how did we even come up with biodiversity? Um, so talking about biodiversity as itself something that we can all agree upon has been interesting uh, during this conversation. I keep thinking about that. And also considering the ways in which traditional medicine or traditional knowledge is, is as Diego is pointing out, is a concept that's also in flux. Um, but in terms of the, the legal regimes in some of the places where I've done research, um, you know, for African countries, there's a diversity of responses to um, these questions about biodiversity protection. In Ghana, for example, uh, a lot of the discourse has really been around mining and forestry. The timber industry and extraction of gold are two major sources of income. Um, and there's a lot of debates about how to protect the environment when people are seeking you know money for their families there's been a gold rush in ghana um, using chemicals i think a similar thing is happening in colombia um, using chemicals that are being brought in from india and china um, that have had a devastating impact on the environment so much of the national discourse has not really been about um, you know extracting chemicals from plants uh, so much as questions of preserving um, waterways and also the, the timber industry is also very extractive and uh, devastating. So since like around 2017, there have been new laws implemented to try and uh, tamper down the extent to which communities can just clear a field of trees. Um, but, you know, anecdotally, obviously people are able to flout that and, and there can be areas that are hidden and timber that comes down. I know with, even within my own family, I've been told of cases of like, oh, you know, a whole, a whole field of trees was taken out uh, of rare, of rare timber. Um, so I think the, the question of how are we actually implementing um, some of these international conventions is, is really specific to what are the, the tensions on the ground and what are the countries really grappling with? I would say it's more around uh, how do we how do we understand who owns the land? Customary law around land tenure in African countries is something that's really fraught and very complicated because there's so much oral um, testimony about who owns land and family ties are very messy and complicated over time. Um, and whether land is is kept through maternal lines, you know, matrilineal lines or uh, patrilineal line. So, you know, is it the mother's brother who inherits the land or is it the father's children um, who inherit the land? So I, I, I would say that in order to even understand how we're going to preserve um, natural resources, we have to figure out the, the land tenure issues. And to be honest, I got so frustrated with a lot of the <clears throat> cases I was looking at around bioprospecting that I moved into looking at nuclear technology and efforts to um, maintain uh, buffers around a reactor in Ghana and thinking a lot about questions of land ownership and how do communities benefit from a research reactor. Um, so yeah, I, 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 I would say it continues to be, to be quite fraught. Um, I don't know how much time we have to go on. I, I, I have other things to say, but I'll come back to it as, as we go on. Yeah, thank you, Abena. Um, I'm also aware of the time, and 
I just wanted to open uh, a few minutes for uh, for you to be able to discuss some of the audience's questions. Um, I'm seeing uh, one here for Abena now that we were just with you. Um, since the, uh, yeah, this is Maria Julia Oliva asks uh, asking. Uh, since the adoption of the CBD and Nagoya Protocol and other laws, what would you say has changed in the ethics and good practices of research into plants for medicinal or other purposes? Any any thoughts on on what is new, what has changed, um, or, or what could be changing? Um, I think what's actually happening is there's, there's a bit of a second green gold rush, actually. As, as um, the Nagoya Protocol was um, developed in 2010, um, it took a few years to come into force in 2014, and we're really only getting it in force in a lot of countries now. It's taken 10 years. And, and if you look at the, the pattern landscaping that I've been doing um, for Australia, the Pacific Islands, other places, um, there's, there's been a huge acceleration in um, patent filings relating to many of these plants in, in recent years, in the last decade. <laughs> so it's like people are racing um, to monopolize plant resources before a regime comes into place. Um, so I think there's definitely some highly unethical stuff going on. Um, and I'd, I think it's probably quite deliberate. Um, but then on the other hand, I think the regime, it, because it is coming into force now in, uh, in countries. Um, so for example, in Europe, there's a regime in place. Um, researchers, uh, when they um, want to take a biological resource from Australia, for example, the, the researchers from the United Kingdom will ask us for um, details of our legislation and, and evidence of a contract. And, and um, because they don't want to be in breach of the Nagoya Protocol in the home countries where they'll get punished because there's reciprocity built into the way that Nagoya Protocol works. Um, so the, the, it, it will have some force eventually. Um, it's just that it's piecemeal still at the moment. Um, so that's, I think, part of the challenge. So I think, I think that is, for Mar Maria Hulia's question, it, it's forcing it down supply chains um, for big companies. Um, so we've seen that in the Pacific too. So big companies like Aveda and L'Oreal and whoever are buying natural ingredients from other places and they're, they're probably doing R&D on it. Um, so it's within the Goya scope. And because they're operating in Europe but they're buying it in another country like Vanuatu, um, because they're dealing with this other country that and, and they have a Nagoya law in, in, in Europe, they, they have to comply. Otherwise, they can be punished in within the European, European jurisdiction for non-compliance in Vanuatu. Um, so we're seeing that happen. It's just there's a lot of confusion and frustration from researchers and companies just about how how to do a negotiation, how to how to good, get a good deal, get good deal, how to who to approach, who's the right landholder, who provides access, um, who's the traditional knowledge holder. So there's so many assumptions about, you know, when you go to a country, I just walk up to a traditional knowledge holder and I'll buy, I'll buy it from them. Or you know, it, it's so complicated to actually do the negotiation. It's, so it's actually frustrating for researchers. Um, but um, yeah, I think I think um, it, it's changing. It's but but there's, there's a few things going on as it's changing. Yeah. Thanks, Daniel. Uh, one of the uh, people in the audience, Akhila, has made two questions, but I'll focus on the second one she made, uh, given that we've already covered a bit on, on law, and I think Diego could uh, shed light on, on this question. Uh, Akhila asks, what are some of the ways to enable indigenous communities to file or own their own cultural knowledge in a contemporary, relevant manner to them, I'm assuming relevant to them? How do we address the gap between the university educated and legacy attained knowledge with an aim to empower? So what is the, uh, I'll allow myself to, to reframe here, um, what, how are indigenous peoples positioned in, in bioprospecting in vis-a-vis -vis their knowledge? Sorry, uh, you're muted, Diego. Uh, I just wanted to, to make a remark about the gender question before I could answer this, this question. It's very important 
And, and I think that's the, the, the most, most fundamental of this discussion that I, was, that I did from my research is that uh, what is really important, we are very preoccupied that people are making money in this big multinational uh, industries are making a lot of money with the knowledge and the plants that are collected in indigenous and riverside communities. Uh, but I think the most important thing is how this practice affects the life of these people and their relation with plants. Because what we see in the community is that plant is not, a, it's not only a therapeutic resource. It's a social, uh, very important social mean, um, instrument of relationship between parents, between mothers and daughters, between grandmothers and grandchildren, between uh, husband and, and wife, right? So we, we, as, you, as I try to show you is that uh, you, the, 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 process, the process of making traditional remedies is a knowledge of the women. Okay? They have that, uh, that knowledge um, it, and it's very important to value and, and what it means to be a woman on that community. Right, so you have a, a social value associated with medicinal plants that goes further of the therapeutic use, right? But you also have men's knowledge because a lot of plants are collected on the forest, okay? And these plants are brought to the to, to their to their houses and given to their wives, and they are transformed into medicinal remedies. So we have gender relation being constructed through the plants, through the medicinal plants. And that's the most important patrimony that we have to keep alive because that's that deals with the life of this culture in this community, in this local region of circulation production of plants. So we have to think about how this different uses, this different knowledge practice that research do with medicinal plants affect the life of these people and their cultures. I think that's more important than thinking about benefit sharing as a contractual model, right? When you give, where you legitimate, legitimate the access to these plants and this knowledge, given what, one or 3% of the, of, of the profits, right? So it's a very capitalistic way of thinking about this matter, okay? So I think we have to reinforce these re relations and it's not intergenerate, uh, it's not just the relation between generations, but also gain the relations that uh, uses the plants and animals uh, as a way of relation between, between the genders. I just wanted to, to I, I think that the, 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 the main important question is that and that that has to do to, to deal also with the other question, right? Um, that Daniel responded, and I just wanted to comment on uh, is because um, I think things are changing on the on, on the scientific practice. Okay? Uh, all this problematization, this ethical and political problematization of the relationship between science and traditional, or what's been called traditional knowledge, and that's a very heterogeneous field. Right, uh, has uh, put the scientist in a situation when he has to think about how his research contributes to the community life. Okay, and and that's not just something that comes from the researchers, but community community people are um, putting them on the on the on the. I don't know how you call it here in Brazil. We call it sinuca de bico. They put them in a bad situation where they have to, right, to think about benefit sharing, and not just in an economical perspective, but as I said, other kind of project that can reinforce community uh, knowledge and culture, right? So I think practices are starting to, to, to change. You can see that on research protocols of different areas, at like the botanic, at the pharmacology, they are all redoing their, their ethicals. Uh, from this from this problematization, trying to think of other kinds of exchange that they can establish 
uh, with the community. So indigenous uh, groups and their representative, other peasant communities and riverside communities, they are very mobilized, very aware uh, of, of this right of, of, of negotiation of their knowledge, right? Not just in an economic perspective, right? But trying to preserve their culture and their local knowledge. And, and I think uh, we have a situation in Brazil where uh, worker party government a really open a space of discussion inside government that was very difficult because you had different interests involved in that but you had a space of discussion now we don't have anymore that space of start discussion what we actually have is destruction of the forest destruction of their culture the miners go inside indigenous territory uh, depredating their resources we have necro scene going right now on on every on Brazilian territory, right? We have a non-government uh, that has uh, um, associated with the worst forces, capitalistic forces that we have in Brazil, right? And that's a destruction movement of, of, of people's culture and the biodiversity that we have in the Amazon. And that that's the worst thing that we have to fight right now. We have to, to be very aware of who are our enemies and who are the people that he can establish political association to fight this necrocene area that we are living in. Thank you. Thank you, Diego. I thought we could uh, explore one more question with Daniel and then one more with Abena to close with Abena. So um, Sarah asks Daniel, uh, how the benefit sharing examples you've discussed uh, differ or share characteristics with corporate social responsibility, which tends to involve uh, donation of materials, infrastructure that are considered appropriate to the company rather than uh, having negotiations that are uh, shared and discussed uh, with uh, local stakeholders directly? Um, that's a really good question, and that this a lot of this is happening. Um, so a lot of companies are um, doing a kind of corporate social responsibility um, exchange uh, in the absence of access and benefit sharing frameworks. So for example, the Moroccan example I gave, um, I call it a hypothetical access and benefit sharing case because there's no framework, there's no legal framework in Morocco. They haven't ratified the Nagoya Protocol, or they hadn't. Last time I checked, maybe maybe they have now, but it, I don't think they have. Um, so the companies involved said, okay, well, there's this legal, there's this international framework, we should be doing fair and equitable benefit sharing. Um, so they they did it on a, a bilateral basis, on a, on a kind of corporate social responsibility basis. So they said, okay, we can share all these benefits, we, we'll pay all this extra money, we'll set up a fair trade arrangement, et cetera, et cetera. So there's, there's multiple elements to it. Um, and, and, um, and, and, the, and it looks like a women's empowerment project. And then, of course, L'Oreal bought the body shop and the body shop, you know, is, is very into community fair trade and women's empowerment and all that sort of stuff too, or that's how they brand themselves. So um, it went on from there in that Moroccan case. And there's a lot of other examples like that too. The, the Papua New Guinean case I gave as well was like that because there wasn't a clear legal framework. So some of the partners involved actually started drafting a, a law um, for the government. <laughs> um, and um, that was what was in place for quite a while. Um, but but they kind of came in and said, we'll, we'll share these benefits, we'll set up a contract, we'll, we'll do these things. Um, so yeah, there's quite a bit of that happening, I think. Um, in, in the absence of ABS frameworks or in the absence of clarity about how to go around doing it. Um, so yes, that's, that's definitely right. Um, the only other thing I wanted to say, um, and it kind of links some of the things that Abena and Diego was saying, um, was about um, customary law. And, and in the Pacific, it's really interesting to work um, in this space in relation to traditional knowledge and, and um, bioprospecting because customary law is really strong in the Pacific and the constitutions, um, most of the Melanesian countries and Poly many of the Polynesian countries recognize 
um, custom, customary law um, to some extent. And, and, and it's really important because um, it, it, a lot of the traditional customary practices and, and beliefs are, are different to our ideas in, in Western, um, about Western ownership and property. So people have um, different rights and responsibilities in relation to land and marine areas and also to plants and animals. Um, and so, like I said, they can have, they might have totemic relationships or kinship relationships with, with species and things like that. Um, and so um, the way it works in the Pacific is really interesting, particularly in countries like Vanuatu or Cook Islands, um, because of um, the strength of customary law, um, the, the, this sort of idea that we can come in and, and file patents relating to an innovation um, based on a traditional resource um, clearly doesn't sit well with a lot of people because they have um, relations, uh, relationships and they have rights and responsibilities to the plants and to, to the land and to the sea. Um, and, they're, and they're different to ownership. So they're, they're passed down from generation to generation. So, so it's not like they own that block of land and all, everything on it. It's, it's like they have these rights and responsibilities I know property works through rights and responsibilities as well, but, but they're different rights and responsibilities. Um, so I think that's really important to recognise in, in this context. And um, it's certainly really interesting to, to study that in the Pacific compared to Australia, which is colonised and um, has a native title system which, which poorly recognises customary law. So Australia has a much more fraught and, and tense relationship with its traditional owners in Australia. And so that's going to, that actually makes the, this sort of bioprospecting situation really difficult in Australia. Um, but some traditional owners have, have got partnerships on their own because they see the importance of sharing their traditional innovations relating to um, traditional medicines and things like that. Um, so yeah, it, it links back to the question, some of the questions before that Abena and Diego raised. Um, yeah, there are geographical differences, even New Zealand too. So in New Zealand, um, they've got a treaty, the Treaty of Waitangi. So in Australia, we see them as more advanced in relation to Indigenous rights. Um, but New Zealand's been very slow and cautious about thinking about the Nagoya Protocol and, 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 and how to deal with these issues because um, they haven't been able to resolve these um, these questions about ownership rights and responsibilities and relationships to, to, to nature that the Maori people have in, in New Zealand. And so the Crown is, is like, so the, the government in New Zealand is just, they don't know where to start, I think. Um, so so that's, that's, a, that's going to be a long discussion. Um, uh, so the, yeah, every, every country is, is in our, in this region here anyway, has, has is taking a different approach and, and has very different geographical and cultural contexts and that totally affects the way the laws will work and can work thanks thank you daniel uh for our, the last question i'd like to take from the audience uh oliver asks something to all the speakers but i would like to invite abena to to her uh, initial thoughts on this oliver asks what are going to be the impacts of climate change on bioprospecting and vice versa Something uh, I, I find really interesting of the topic of climate change in relation to bioprospecting, and this is my own addition to Oliver's question, is, uh, and that's why I wanted to share this with you, Abena, um, is that climate change seems to uh, change our, our notion of urgency and time. So from a, uh, the perspective of a, a historian uh, of bioprospecting, what do the temporalities that come with the narrative of climate change do for how we understand bioprospecting and do they affect each other? No, this is a great question. Throughout our conversations today, I've been thinking a lot about the COVID-19 crisis since I'm trained primarily as a historian of medicine and I teach a class on history of epidemic disease. Um, thinking about the 1990s when I was growing up and this concern that the Amazon might be destroyed and we should 
preserve indigenous communities. Now the Amazon is on fire and and the world has, has had new diseases released and, and it's much more catastrophic, I think, than even we were worrying about when people were considering chemical prospecting and benefit sharing and ways to preserve nature. I think we're almost like past that. We've, we've, we've lost the plot. We haven't preserved nature. We don't have anything under control. Everybody is, is fleeing from disease and pestilence and it's just a horror story right now. And I wonder how this is going to impact as you're saying, the ways in which we think about some of these benefits sharing and thinking about um, uh, the relationships between humans and the earth, really. Um, I don't know what I can necessarily say about climate change directly. Uh, I can offer something maybe more of a micro historical thought, which I've been also considering in our discussions. Um, all of these questions about biodiversity prospecting and benefit sharing to me hinge on questions of power, capacity building, who's at the helm in these, these negotiations. And, and I really balk at this idea of external actors coming into countries, really trying to quickly suss out what the laws are and, and do their best to get the information and the, the resources they need and bolt out. And, yet that's really what a lot of this is about it's or it's 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 kind of boiled down to well how best can corporations get what they need um at, without flouting local laws and without getting uh their their hands wrapped back home ironically when i look at this case i discussed in ghana the the state pharmaceutical company so ghana set up its own pharmaceutical company in 1962 at around the time of independence with high hopes that ghana would be producing its own pharmaceuticals that it could be kind of a flag uh for for african countries a flagship um manufacturing facility but instead what happens the state pharmaceutical company is what's bought out by fighter Riker the case I described a, an American-based company buys out Ghana's pharmaceutical corporation really um, a state-run run go, uh, government holding corporation that couldn't be solvent and so they sold it off really to an American firm um, and a, an American company that was involved in bioprospecting and involved in trying to get patents from from uh, related to African plants. And for me, that's kind of the tragedy of all of this is that we've, we've fallen from a point of people having really high hopes and a sense of a more equal and level playing field um, and, and it hasn't come to pass. And we see this with the COVID crisis right now. We aren't getting vaccines out of African countries. We're not getting therapeutics out of African countries or uh, COVID organics notwithstanding, you know, the Malagasy remedy from um, Ar Artemisia. But there is this sense that like, that it is a stratified playing field. Um, it looks like we're out of time. Yeah, I, ju I just wanted to um, invite you to wrap up in the yeah, coming minutes. Sorry, sorry, sorry. Yeah, sorry, sorry. I mean, I, I guess, I guess I don't know. I, I, when you think, when we say climate change, I perhaps I'm thinking I'm a, on a slightly s smaller scale and thinking about disease um, and wondering, wondering what the future holds. Really, really wondering. Yeah, I think that the observation has a lot to do with uh, what we, the phenomenology of climate change, what feels like climate change, you know, and at what scale we can we can perceive that. Um, so before uh, the the meeting ends, I wanted to once again thank you all, Adena, Daniel, and Diego. This has been a really wonderful and enjoyable conversation. The conversations that you had between your own presentations was really fertile and inspiring. And I'm sure the whole audience, online audience, uh, joins me in a big virtual clap that we send you. And as you all said, uh, I hope we can meet in person sometime soon. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you for, for attending. And thank you for organizing this, Emiliana. Thank you. Thank you, Emiliano, for organizing. And also, it was a pleasure to share this moment with my colleagues. It was very good to hear from you. Wonderful. Looking forward for better days. <laughs> yes, <laughs> yeah, exactly. To everyone in the audience, please do remember following ISDG, the Indigenous Studies Discussion Group, um, on social media so we can continue the conversations elsewhere. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye.